No, a long time ago. Long Ten time years ago. ago. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Um, wow, it's great to see all of you here. If any of you who can't really see want to sort of go in the middle, feel free. Um, the, I don't know how good the viewing is over there, but can't be too good. Um, so my group knows where this picture was taken. And these, these are a bunch of my students um, and postdocs and things. But who, outside of that group, where is this picture taken? Pardon? ESP, that's right. So in between the, uh, those offices, there's this uh, slope here, which uh, so that, that's, that's what the group is. A little blue sky superimposed behind there. So, uh, so I want to talk about the promise and pitfalls of silicon photonics. So I'll talk a lot about all the other stuff that's going on around the world in terms of silicon photonics and getting light out of silicon. And uh, talk a bit about what, what we're doing in our group as well. Um, so a lot of collaborators, uh, particularly Dan Blumenthal, Larry Cauldron, Steve Dunbar, Nadir Dagley, uh, and then a lot of students and postdocs in my group in particular, and then folks at Intel, Orion, and, and Hewlett Packard, um, and then supported primarily by DARPA, Intel, Hewlett Packard. So there's a group within the institute uh, called the Electronics Photonics Group, which has these folks on it, and they all do different things, but in particular, a bunch of people are focused on optics. Uh, certainly Dan Blumenthal, who spoke a couple weeks ago about the uh, terabit optical ethernet, myself, Larry Cauldron, um, and then uh, Luke in particular, uh, is obviously around the electronics end, we're talking very much about how do we combine these two things together. And, uh, and there are two new centers within here. Uh, one is PICO that Larry Cauldron runs, which is a new coherent optics uh, center. And then Dan talked about this terabit optical ethernet uh, uh, center about two weeks ago. So th there's some new things happening. This is uh, Larry Center Pico. Uh, it has a lot of industrial parts. In fact, it's, it's matched. The DARPA matches industrial spending. Um, but in particular, the goal is to make a lot of photonic chips to do coherent transmitters and receivers. So what I'll talk about today is sort of the technology to do photonic integration. But in the end, our goal is to put a lot of different devices together on a chip to do particular things. And this is the TOEIC that Dan talked about. So again, we're going from gigabit ethernet to 10 gigabit ethernet to now 100 gigabit ethernet is being, being deployed. And, uh, and this center is focused on what's after that, namely terabit ethernet. And again, what I'll talk about today is the technology that would go into terabit transmitters or, or receivers. Um, all right, so what does this have to do with the institute and, and with energy efficiency? Um, so today, depending on how you count it, something like 4% of electricity goes towards the internet and, and data centers. And if you include PCs, the number's larger. Um, but whatever number you choose, somewhere between 3 and 6%, the point is that the traffic, internet traffic doubles every 18 months. And so in three years, that's four times as much. In nine years, that's 64 times as much. So 64 times 4% is twice the total electricity used today. That's the problem that we have to address. And that's why making photonics more efficient for uh, internet is, is what we're really, really focused on. So that's the motivation. And there's various slides that you've seen lots of. This is one example of, of internet traffic versus time. And this is, again, fairly recent, right? This is 2008, 2010. We're going from being dominated by file, file sharing to dominated by internet video. Um, but again, these rates are, are getting very fast. And, and the measure here is, is exhibits, right? Um, the driver, you all know um, better than I do. But one example is Facebook. So this was a slide that Facebook showed at an optics conference um, in October 2009. It was the first time I'd ever seen a Facebook person at an optics conference, actually. And, uh, <laughs> and he noted that they had 200 million uh, users. And that was October 2009. 
And as you know, just nine months later, there are 500 million users, and I don't know what they are today, but it's growing very fast. And the point that he'd like to make about it was people spend a lot more time on Facebook than anything else. So the number of, of users is increasing, but it's much stickier than everything else that we used to think about. Um, so uh, that, that's the driver. Um, this is a picture, again, this is actually from his talk, Don Lee's talk, uh, of, a, of a data center. He points out this is not Facebook's data center. Um, I don't know which one it is. But uh, the point being, all this yellow stuff, there's a lot of fiber optics in a data center today, right? All the top of rack connections from servers get connected with fibers today. Um, what we're really looking at is, is the need to get ever more capacity out of a given rack and the need to get the fibers down on, on perhaps onto the chip themselves. And that's the motivation for today's talk. So today we're at sort of tens of thousands of fibers. Um, we're certainly going to a million fibers in not very many years. IBM, their plan for their, uh, their 2018 supercomputer has over a million fibers inside of it, and uh, just one supercomputer. So that's sort of not too far off the annual production of optical fibers in the United States today, and end up being in, in one, one supercomputer in 2019. So there's lots of data we need to send around um, from obviously all the stuff we're, we're doing, transferring files off our computer to media, to, to medical uh, databases, everything going medical rather than hard uh, paper based, to physics, Large Hadron Collider generating 300 exabytes per year. So that's, that's what needs to be transmitted and increasingly, you know, obviously as we all move to the cloud, um, and, and that requires lots of routers. So this is, this is Cisco's router. This is actually their old router, right? The CRS-1, they're now in the CRS-3. But basically, total, it's, it's a 92 terabit uh, system, which is not very much when you have to transmit exabits. Um, but uh, it's 80 racks of equipment. It takes a megawatt of power. So that's the goal we're trying to do. We need to be 10 times, you know, you can't have you know, 10 times that much data in 10 years and, and, and have every router taking 10 megawatts, we need to be much more efficient. And that's what today's talk is about. So this slide, I believe, is an Intel slide I borrowed from Tim Cheng. Is that where it originally comes from? Probably yeah. Um, and so it just shows the other part of the problem. Part of it is power, but the other part of the problem is, is uh, power density. And so this shows power density versus time. And this is old, right? This is, you know, Pentium 4s. Most of you probably don't even remember Pentium 4s. I don't know. Um, but the amount of power density is getting pretty high. And as we go out to where we are today, it's certainly getting to be very high. And you know, a typical processor, we all have fans right on the processor chip, and the laptop gets warm on our lap. But we need to find ways of making uh, things much more power efficient. Um, and here's almost the last slide, um, but showing that the same thing happened with bipolar technology. Um, when it, power density got up to where we are today, that drove the invention of CMOS. And we're now up here, and that's driving basically multi-core processors and 3D integration, things like that. And so there's lots of multi-core processors out these days. Um, the latest one from NVIDIA is 512 cores. Um, and the point being that if you've got 200 data lines, and this doesn't run at 5 gigahertz, but in a few years it'll be at 5 gigahertz. 200 data lines times 5 gigahertz is a terabit of data. And 500 cores is 500 terabits of data. That's like a, a national communication system on a chip. And that's what we need to be able to do. Um, so today, those 10,000 fibers in that, in that data center I showed are all based on, on either gallium arsenide for very short interconnects or indium phosphide. In fact, most of those are gallium arsenide. Um, and what we're talking about today is how do we do it all in silicon? How do we do something which is CMOS compatible and we can integrate right down to the CMOS chip? That's, that's, that's the issue. So we need to do all this so that Facebook can keep going? Yes, we, that's our whole goal. That's all we want to do is, is keep you on Facebook. That's it. <laughs> so, so here's a slide out of uh, uh, IBM. Jeff Cash, uh, you know, how do you get to exascale computing? And the whole idea now is you can't have memory and processor side by side. The latency is too long and there's too much power required. So you need to stack them vertically. And you might have three or four memory planes stacked vertically on a logic plane. But then you'd have one more plane, which is the photonic plane. And that's what's causing or allowing all the interconnection between the different cores. And so you'd have some basically, 
This looks like a, uh, a big network, basically, for on-chip computing or on-chip interconnection between one core here and one core here, as well as interconnection off the chip to remote uh, uh, memory and, and remote uh, interconnects and things like that. Um, so that's, that's really where we're going. That's where they believe they will be before 2019. And so we would like to make these photonic devices. You need to make switches. You need to make amplifiers because all these things have loss. So it just doesn't work without some reamplification. It's like a, trying to make an electronic circuit without an electronic amplifier. You can't be very big. Um, we need to make detectors to absorb that, the uh, data and, and read it on a given core. We need modulators or, or lasers that take the data from a given core and put it onto this network and allow it to be sent around. Um, there are a lot of very interesting protocol issues about how you operate these systems because there's no buffer typically. Um, so, and you can't have a lot of overhead. So for all the folks in the rest of the department doing scheduling and things like this, it's a very interesting problem um, that isn't very well solved at this point. So the basic problem is that silicon has an indirect band gap, which means if you put electrons and holes in there, you get heat. You don't get, you get phonons, you don't get photons. So that's the basic, basic problem that we focus on. Um, because silicon is indirect band gap, it's also a really poor absorber. The absorption coefficient of a detector, silicon detector at these wavelengths is at least 100, if not 1,000 times lower than, than indium phosphide or gallium arsenide. So you have to make the detector 1,000 times thicker to absorb the light. Um, silicon is centrosymmetric, so the electrooptic coefficients are zero. So uh, Professor Dagley makes lots of modulators in gallium arsenide. First order, that doesn't work because there is no the electrooptic coefficient is zero. These are typically based on silicon, SOI wafers, silicon, silicon dioxide, silicon. So there's this SiO2 layer there, which is thermally resistive, and so you know. In most lasers, you never put a uh, thermally resistive layer underneath your, your laser. That, that's an issue. And finally, silicon is reciprocal, which means you can't make an isolator out of it. It's, it's, uh, you need a non-reciprocal material like YIG or something like that, such that light going one way is passed and light going the other way is not passed. That's really important if you go back underneath this picture to all this networks like this. If you don't force the light to all go one direction, then it builds up in the other direction, which you don't want, and, and the whole thing doesn't scale very well. So you really need to make non-reciprocal elements uh, on these systems. So those are my pitfalls. Okay? Those are the things we need to solve. Um, and, and we have efforts in, in all of these, actually. So that's, that's very much the focus. What we're trying to do, basically, is take the invention of the laser, which has not been used in communication on chips yet, but was done 50 years ago. This is now the 50th anniversary of the laser. Um, and now their lasers are typically big, right? That's a centimeter across. Um, uh, so 50 years ago it was invented. Same thing with the, the transistor, right? Or at least the first silicon IC was 51 years ago. And uh, we've gone from that to now billions of transistors uh, on a die. Our goal is, can we combine these two things together? Can we take basically the invention of the laser and the invention of, of silicon integrated circuits and end up with, quote, this is, okay, this is really marketing hype, but he's actually, a, he actually is an engineer. Justin Ratner used to design supercomputers, um, but uh, I guess Luke probably knows him pretty well, but he's now gone over to the dark side, okay, so optical anywhere, incredible potential, so, um, but I've drunk the Kool-Aid, so I'll, I'll admit I, I, I believe in it. So if you look at, at sort of where technology is, you know, this is a long time ago when Silicon was on six inch substrates, right? And uh, with 270 nanometer pitch. Um, now it's, you know, it's down here somewhere, but certainly where we want to affect things is out here, say 2016. We're out at 18 inch wafers and, and 22 nanometer lithography. The question is, any phosphide photonic integrated circuits are back here. And so if we can do all of this, if we can make all these optical devices on silicon, we can sort of jump six generations technology and we absolutely can jump that many iterations, right? Because we're not going to build these fabs for photonics. The whole idea is just use a, a CMOS foundry for photonics. That's, that's the real power of what could happen if this is successful. So this is clear. So I mentioned all the pitfalls of silicon. There are some advantages of silicons. Um, 
you know, a 12-inch substrate costs about the same as a 2-inch indiophosphide substrate. It's a lot cheaper per square centimeter. Substrates are larger. We can use existing CMOS facilities um, with much better process control. If you guys want to come in, they're just sit in the, sit in the center. Um, absorption coefficients of silicon are 100 times less than indiophosphide. That's really useful if you want to make a mode lock laser for high power pulses. That's an inherent advantage. Waveguide losses are lower. Uh, thermal conductivity is higher. So the SiO2 is poor, but silicon is actually a very good thermal conductor. And that's important for, for modulators and things like that, and, and as, as well as photodetectors. And you can make a very good avalanche photodiode. I won't talk about that, but Dao Shun Dai is here somewhere. And, and he's demonstrated some really spectacular avalanche photodiodes with very high gain balance products, much higher than any other 3.5. And that's inherent the way the silicon works. So there are some advantages to silicon. So what I want to talk about now is how do you um, get light out of silicon? And you know, down at the bottom here is the stuff that we do. But I'll talk about all the other stuff that's going on just to give you some flavor. Because there's a lot of, it's a very active research field. Um, you know, there are now conferences just focused on silicon photonics. And uh, let's look at what, they, what, what they're doing. So if you just take silicon, PN junction, and forward bias it, you get light out. I don't know if anyone's done that, but you can see it. Um, you have to put a lot of current into it, and you don't get much light out, about a percent. Um, so it does work, but our whole goal here is to make more efficient communication. We want to use transmit data off an le electronic chip for less power than it takes today. So we need to make efficient devices. If, if we live with the 1%, it, it's not ever going to happen. You can take an SiO2 layer and sequentially pulse it positive and negative, and you first inject electrons in, into, a, into a either just a piece of silicon, nanocrystal of silicon, um, and then you pulse the other polarity and you get the hole into there. And as you can see here, when you, when you apply this, you can get initially uh, one injection, then the, the other carrier injection, you can, get, you can get light out of this on, on those two transitions. Again, incredibly inefficient. Um, you can pattern silicon. And there's a lot of work on patterning silicon, and there's various ideas about why this may work. Um, this is some of the work uh, Jimmy Zhu's group that does. And they're seeing some significant emission at about 1.3 microns. And so this is a band structure of silicon. You have the valence band down here at, the, at k equals 0. You have the conduction band over here at a different value of k space. And the problem is that when you make this transition from up here, electron here recombines here, there's a big momentum change. And that's what times I have any momentum to speak of. So uh, that's why it's forbidden. And you're much more likely to emit a phonon than a photon. But they believe that by doing this patterning, they're creating a, a, a state, basically, at this k equals 0 point, And you can get vertical transitions here and light out of it. And they are certainly seeing light emission. Not yet any lasing or anything like that, but you can get emission. Other things people are doing, again, making silicon nanocrustal clusters, and then doping them with, with elements like erbium. Erbium is a rare earth. There's a natural transition at 1.5 microns. And it turns out by putting erbium here, it's more efficient. And uh, so people can make devices that emit light uh, with, with silicon nanocrystals. And you can do it with optical pumping. And you can do it with electrical pumping. And uh, again, this wavelength is not very useful for a lot of what we want to do because silicon is absorptive at 800. So you know, silicon is pretty absorptive out to about here. But, but that's where this is working right now. And you can put other elements in there, not just erbium at 1.5. You can put terbium, ytterbium, and you can get light output. Again, the efficiencies tend to be pretty small. I think actually this number, if anything, is a little optimistic, 10% efficiency. Uh, I'm not convinced that's really been seen, but on that order. But to make, to reduce the amount of power it takes, and it, to do communications, we need efficiencies that are more like 50, 60, 70 percent. I think this is my last slide in this approach. This is Boston University's work, again, putting erbium inside silicon nitride. And they found that using silicon nitride rather than silicon dioxide, they can get more efficient uh, output. And this is starting to look, uh, there's arbitrary units here for scale, but maybe, maybe promising in terms of getting towards a laser. OK, so those are all the different things you can put primarily rare earths inside oxide or nitride. 
or nanocrystals, things like that. Another general approach that Intel made a lot of press about is making Raman lasers. And so this is a ring laser. And what they noticed, as well as UCLA, was that the Raman coefficient in silicon is like a thousand times higher than glass. And so everyone before them had made Raman lasers in, in optical fibers, and they were long, hundreds of meters, a kilometer fiber. But because the Raman coefficient is so much higher in a crystalline material, they were able to make this fairly small, a few centimeters in size. And they could make some pretty nice lasers. So everything up to now, nothing's been a laser. But now they're making lasers with 10, 15, 20 milliwatts of output power. That's serious. That's something you can use to put through a network. Um, and the efficiency is now getting better, 23%. That's starting to become useful. The problem with this is you still need a pump, right? A Raman laser is very nice, but it's just sort of a wavelength converter. You have to pump some shorter wavelength, and, and it will get lazy at a longer wavelength. So it's interesting. They made a lot of progress, but doesn't really solve the problem we're looking to do. So what about putting some other material on there? Either putting uh, things like uh, germanium, or growing quantum dots, or growing nanopillars of M using MOCVD, and various things. So I'll talk about these, and then uh, I'll talk about bonding approaches to do this. So this is the work out of MIT. So that's, that's the work that, that you're familiar with, Stockton. Um, so germanium is also indirect gap, like silicon. But unlike silicon, it's almost equal. And so particularly if you strain it, you can get it very close together. And so if you dope, put, dope this heavily n-type, put a lot of electrons here, a bunch of them will make it over to this gamma valley, and you can get emission here. And so this shows optical pumping. And as you pump it harder and harder, you can get lasing to occur. So these are the fabry pro modes of this laser. And it's, it's a laser. The nice thing about this laser is that the hotter it gets, the, more easy, the easier it is to get these electrons over to here. And so the hotter it gets, the better the efficiency becomes, at least up through about uh, 60, 70 degrees C. And so that's, that's the exciting part. Um, and so they are getting emission. And I'm confident they will see electrically pumped lasing. Whether it's when it occurs uh, isn't clear. But sometime in the next year, I'm confident they will see electrically pumped lasing. The inherent problem with this approach is that you need a lot of carriers here. And uh, silicon has a pretty high free carrier absorption coefficient. So all those carriers provide loss. And so it is unclear whether you can make a really good optical material with germanium. But they made a lot of progress, and we'll see. Um, Right now, you know, 50 microjoules is something like, uh, you know, it's a, uh, you know, kilowatts per square centimeter. It's, this is not a, a low power approach yet, but, um, but that's what they're doing. Um, but Acharya at Michigan is growing quantum dots on silicon, and uh, their argument is when you grow a quantum dot, the dislocations won't penetrate into the quantum dot but rather they'll, they'll go around the quantum dots. So you can grow dots and then barium and gallium arsenide, grow more dots and barium. And there will be dislocations in these regions, but not dislocations here. So as long as both carriers are in the quantum dot region, then uh, you're OK. And they made a laser. So again, this is now what I would call a serious result. They're getting 20 or 30 milliwatts output. Um, and they can modulate it reasonably fast, 5.5 gigahertz. So this, this is a viable approach. Um, and uh, I would say of everything I've showed so far, this is the most viable approach. Um, the other thing is to basically go back and use 3,5 materials, indium gallium arsenide phosphide, which we typically use. And you can bond them down. This is a chip made by Luxterra. And you can't really see it very well. But if you, this blow up here shows that they've got lots of devices, literally a million transistors on this optical chip. And they've integrated those million transistors with about 30 optical devices. And uh, they can make an interesting uh, active optical cable. So again, their approach is uh, basically to imagine this is a cable. Um, make the, the end of this, their, their whole product line basically is to make cables that have the end be electrical. But right inside of there is a laser. And that laser communicates to the other end of an optical fiber to a detector. And uh, that's, that's an active optical cable. And that's what their business is based on. And that is certainly the future, right? The future is going to that because these cables, like, like these, are pretty expensive, right? Um, there's lots of copper filaments in here, and their bandwidth is very limited. 
So uh, if you want more capacity, higher density uh, displays, then you need something like an optical fiber. And it ends up being cheaper anyway. So, so that's their product, and this is their approach. Um, but the problem is to get light, laser light out of here, they bond one laser chip for every wavelength of, of light. And where we want to get to, it probably has 100 lasers per transmitter. If you want to do terabit, you need something like 100 lasers probably. Maybe not, but that's one approach. So this, this is what they're doing. This, again, is commercial. Um, different approach is what we call heterogeneous integration. Basically, bonding pieces of, of good optical material that, that lases, indium dimarsite phosphide, onto a wafer of silicon. And uh, this is pretty good. This is a, this is a 200 millimeter, 8 inch substrate. And you put the 3.5 material where you need it. So there's some complex circuit here. And you just put the 3.5, the lazy material, where you need it. Um, you don't need it everywhere. And the nice thing about this approach is it immediately scales to 200 millimeter, 300 millimeter diameter wafers. Um, right now, you can't get 3.5 material in that size. So if you put it just where you need it, you can scale up to that size. So the idea is you bond it down, and then you etch off the substrate, leaving just a thin film. And then you process it just like you'd process any other material. This bonding process was just a way to put down a micron thick layer of crystalline indium dimarsite phosphide on the surface. So this, is, uh, this work goes on here. This work goes on at, at Intel. It goes on at Ghent, uh, at a group called IMEC. And this, is actually, this, this slide is actually one of IMEC's slides. There's two ways to do this. Primarily what IMEC does is to bond these three five layers to silicon. This is a silicon waveguide. This is a void. So it's confined right here with a thin layer of uh, polyimide and, uh, or some other uh, adhesive layer. And typically, to make these things work, that layer has to be really thin, something like 100 nanometers thick or less. Um, and that's one approach. And this is, again, a picture uh, of a large wave for a lot of stuff going on. And they put these 3.5 laser chips just where they need them. So if this were some multi-core processor, you just put one per group of cores or, or something like that. Um, the main problem with this approach is that these, these bonding layers are fairly thermally absorptive. And so they, uh, uh, it's hard to get high power out of these because, they're, uh, because of that. What Alex Fung did for his PhD thesis was basically bond on a wafer scale uh, three five layers on the S silicon waveguides, but direct bonding. So again, these are, there's a lot of bonding work that goes on. You know, in fact, all SOI wafers are made by bonding, right? Um, typically, you'll, you'll bond two wafers with SOI2 in them together, and then uh, use the smart cut technique to remove the substrate of one of them. And that leaves you with an SOI wafer. So bonding is common up to 300 millimeter substrates. This is now bonding a 3-5 layer and removing the substrate and then using this layer to amplify the, the light in a silicon waveguide. So that was his thesis. Um, and this is one of the demonstrations he made, which was to put seven lasers close together. So this is, you can't really see this. This is 500 microns, and this is every third laser. So every laser is probably 140 microns apart. But in contrast, that earlier picture from Luxterra, where you know chips that you can handle are sort of half a millimeter across, 500 microns across. You can now get a very high density of, of lasers. So if anyone has questions, by the way, and I don't notice you raise your hand, just shout out. Yeah? So this bonding is still, what's the interface? So this is molecular bonding. Um, well, this is, uh, so basically, it's, you take two wafers and you oxygen plasma treat it, and then you put them together, and that oxygen plasma leaves a reactive surface. And there's a lot of work on the chemistry of this, but a lot of materials, a lot of groups do oxygen plasma enhanced bonding. So you can buy tools from EVG as an example that do this commercially. Um, and again, for SiO2, you know, for all, you know, all memories are pretty much made this way. It's very common, well understood. It's a little less understood for putting three fives on silicon, but it's the same general process. Um, so Dee, unfortunately, is now temporarily left yesterday to China. So he's not here today. But what he worked on was scaling. So we typically make small devices, a couple centimeters across. And he demonstrated doing this on 2-inch, 4-inch, and 6-inch. And I think we are the only people who've made 6-inch, certainly lasers, uh, uh, in the world. 
cinch epitaxy is not very common, um, but this was done with a group at, at Lincoln Labs uh, that does it. So I'll put the question to you. Why not, Andy, you're a good electronics guy. Why not just do six inch indium phosphide processing? Why do it with silicon? How much money you got? <laughs> Okay, dedicated facilities, spending the money to buy a CMOS facility is several billion dollars. That's part of it. But the other problem is that indium phosphide is relatively fragile. And some people say it's about as soft as butter. And that's an exaggeration. But basically, you can't put indium phosphide through automatic wafer handlers at six inch scale. It just, it, they break too often and the yield's too low. And so what we're really doing is taking that six inch wafer, putting the layer on silicon, which you can run through an automatic wafer handler, at high speed, and uh, then make devices. So, what percentage of that layer do you measure weight? So, we remove the whole substrate by a combination of mechanical and uh, chemical etching. But probably the smart thing to do is a smart cut process and reuse the substrate. So, um, and then the, uh, the final layer. On oh, it depends on the circuit. So, we typically put three five over the whole surface we're using, and and. and I don't know, what, 15, 20% depends on the device. Um, you know, how much of it's lasers or modulators. So we'll use the 3.5 layer for lasers and modulators um, and detectors. Um, so it's wasteful. And in fact, yeah, it is wasteful. So one really cool thing, a lot of people here do photoluminescence, and a, lot of, a lot of materials people here. Um, it turns out that the photoluminescence improves with bonding. It's not a question. We used to worry about how do you make it as good after bonding as it was before. It actually gets better. So here's a picture of one of these six inch wafers from, uh, from Lincoln Labs, um, Oakley's group. And uh, if you look at the brightness of it before and afterwards, it actually gets slightly brighter. That's not uncommon. Most 3.5 people see that, probably partially due to annealing out of defects when you bond. But if you look at now the, the uniformity, the full width at half maximum, of this photoluminescence, normally narrower luminescence is better than wide luminescence. It actually gets better afterwards. So this is 40 nanometer full width at half maximum. This is light green color here. And before is 68, which is somewhere in this blue area. Probably that's due to the fact that their uniformity of growth on, on that large substrate isn't very good. And when it cools down to room temperature, this epi layer is under a lot of strain, which is non-uniform. And by bonding and etching off the substrate, we release that strain going back to the substrate. Um, but I don't think it's entirely well understood. So I'll just run through some, some results. Um, this is Andy Chang's result. Uh, he made a CW laser that runs at 105 degrees C. That's a good stepping stone because, again, silicon integrated circuits are going to run at least 90 degrees C. So we better be able to make lasers that work hotter. At 100, this thing's barely lasing, though. So one of our next challenges is certainly to make a much better high temperature laser than this. So uh, this efficiency is about 52%. So again, it's better than 1 or 10%. It needs to be better. Um, Alex, as part of his thesis, made what are called distributed feedback lasers. And so there's gratings along this surface. And this grating provides reflection. And so this is a, a way to make a laser on a surface. It turns out. This device was a Fabry Pro laser, which meant we diced and polished the surfaces to make the mirror cavities of this laser lasing back and forth. The nice thing about this is now this grating right here provides the reflection. So you can put these across the wafer. You don't need any facets. Um, this just shows the spectrum. And this is a, a wider wavelength range. But it's a highly single mode device. And uh, this is as good as any indium phosphide uh, DFB laser. And that's kind of the point of it. This is the work that Sid Jane is doing. And he's doing some really, really interesting stuff that's critical to the platform. So he's doing quantum well intermixing. And up to now, basically, we talked about bonding an epitaxy layer down. And that's fine, but that, that layer that gives you gain, if it's not pumped, gives you loss. And that layer is everywhere. What Sid is able to do with quantum well intermixing is to change the composition of that layer across the wafer. So you can make part of the region transparent for waveguides. Part of it shifted for modulators, and part of it left in the original laser wavelength range. So this is the chip that SID processed. Um, and you can see a bunch of devices over here. Uh, but basically, these are DFBs integrated with, with uh, photodetectors. And over here are uh, DFBs integrated with 
photodetectors and modulators. And what he did in this case was he combined by this quantum linear mixing, he changed the band gap of a bunch of it. So some of it's here, it lasers at these wavelengths at this grading pitch, and part of it's over here at this band gap with this grading pitch, and then part of it's shifted even further to be the modulator, and even further to be a transparent waveguide. So this is a very powerful technique for integrating complex photonic integrated circuits. This is the work that Di Liang is doing. Um, so in particular, Di is now at, at Hewlett Packard, and the group that hired him is a supercomputer group. And uh, what they're looking at is how do I get you know, terabits of data across supercomputer chips? And say Ro Ray Bosolet, who's I think on the computer science, uh, or at least comes down here a lot, he's defined an architecture which relies upon very small, very dense arrays of lasers and modulators, all of which are ring-based. And uh, I don't have all the slides, but the previous structure I showed doesn't work very well for small rings. Because what happens is, is normally everything I showed before, the, this, there's no confinement on this side like it shows here. And consequently, this light radiates out when you make a small diameter ring. What D worked out is a way to etch the 3,5 and the silicon at one time. And so you get confinement in the silicon layer down here, but also you get confinement in the 3,5 layer. So now you can make a very small diameter ring and uh, so these are our old ring lasers. This is a six inch wafer. And you can see these ring lasers here. These are the new ones, which are much smaller in diameter and consequently much lower threshold, much closer to where we need to be for a real supercomputer interconnect. And so the old devices were up here. Um, and the new devices that he's now down to are down, sorry, down here. He well, actually has gotten to as low as about two milliamp threshold on devices. And uh, where he's trying to get to is down here at about half a milliamp or lower. So we can do this. It's theoretically possible. He just needs to get lower loss in the optical cavity to achieve that. And so this is one of these ring devices. And it's coupled to an output waveguide here at this point. So that's, that's kind of where, where we have to get to to make real supercomputer interconnects. This is some work that Hyundai Park did for his PhD thesis. And these are all arrays of optical amplifiers coupled to photodetectors. And it turns out that. If you optically amplify before a detector, you can improve the sensitivity of it by about 8 to 10 dB. And that's inherent. Um, that's, optical amplification tends to have lower noise than electrical amplification for, for optical systems. That's well known. So his devices look just like what I've been showing, except you now try and minimize any reflection here. The light comes in this waveguide. You want to amplify it here. And then it propagates on that waveguide further on. So your goal now is to have minimum reflection right here in each end rather than making a, a laser cavity. And uh, that tends to be hard to do. And that's something we're very much focused on these days. This is the work on modulators. There's a lot of modulator groups around the world. Um, IBM has a big effort in this. And uh, they're very much looking at the supercomputer application. They make a very nice 10 gigabit modulator. Um, that's shown here. And the way they make the modulators, they inject carriers into the modulator. And when you inject carriers, that changes the optical index just from the number of, of, of carriers that's there. And uh, so it's not electro-optic, but, but, but the index does depend upon carrier density. Intel does the same thing. This is their modulator structure. Um, it has this vertical PN junction, but it's sort of a lateral structure here. And they've made up to a 40 gigabit modulator. It's long. It's about a centimeter long or longer. Um, but uh, that's their approach. Other works are to make ring structures. And again, when you put a PN junction here and you forward bias that ring, then you change the resonance wavelength from here to here. You change the optical index of that cavity. So if you're operating at one wavelength, and my laser sits here, and initially it has you know, very low transmission, high loss. And then when you shift it, it goes to very high transmission, low loss. And so this is a way of, of modulating the light through the cavity. And uh, that's the work that goes on at Cornell. Wei Wen Chen here is making modulators. And now she's using three, five layers on silicon. Again, with the quantum intermixing technique, you can have one region. If you have three, five there anyway, it has gain. You use it for the laser. And you use the three, five layer elsewhere to give you a modulator. And the big advantage is if you mix all those other ones I showed, just have the plasma effect. You inject a plasma of electrons and holes, and that changes the index. Now we have a plasma effect, but also we have band filling effects in the three, five. We have pockets effect, Kerr effect. And so you get a much bigger effect. So if you look at one of these modulators, the index change you can get versus bias, this is what you get with si silicon. So that's the plasma effect. 
That's what everybody else has to use. And this is what Waze uses, in total of the red line up there. You add all these effects together, you know, Kerr effect, plasma effect, Pockles effect, you can get that change. So she can get roughly 10 times the index change, or it should take her one-tenth the voltage, or it could be one-tenth as long. That's the big advantage of what Waze is doing. So this is her structure. This looks familiar to Professor Dagley's group because they invented this structure for making gallium arsenide modulators. And by having these T structures and changing the length of the, this little T compared to the gap, you can change the impedance of it. And uh, in this way, you can get impedance matching. If you do it right, you can get velocity matching. And uh, so these are the devices she's making. Um, they're mock senders. You put light in, divides into two sides. And you operate this in a push-pull mode. One side goes high in the decks, one side goes low in the decks. And she can make a bandwidth of about 25 gigahertz. And uh, this shows a 25 gigabit eye, but she's now up to 40 gigabit eyes um, in her latest stuff that she's just uh, measuring these days. The big advantage of this is these are small now, um, 500 microns long, and hopefully smaller in the future. So this is, that was using it as a modulator. This is using it as a two by two switch. This structure out here. This shows a one by two at the end here, but this could be a two by two. So there's two outputs, and by changing the voltage here, you can make it go out of one or the other side. So if you have a switch, you can now make a bigger switch. You combine two by two switches together to make something which is, you know, a 32 by 32 switch, which would be interesting for switching in computer networks. And uh, what this shows is using that to switch 40 gigabit per second data. We could do 100, we could do higher, because again, that's just the data going through that waveguide. That's not the speed at which we're switching it. And uh, what this shows is that the transitions are quite fast, you know, tens of picoseconds long. So we can do packet switching. And in particular, that, that's an interesting application. Um, so we're now going to have a few more slides and get back towards this whole issue of power. This is the power required, and it's in a sort of a strange unit, energy per bit. Um, it could be, you know, uh, watts per gigabit, um, but this is normalized basically in uh, uh, nanojoules per bit. And uh, basically, if you look at, this happens to be a Cisco CRS1 router or an IPv TV server or Ethernet switch that, that uh, Cisco makes, they end up being somewhere up here, around 10 nanojoules per bit. So that, that's where the world is today. Um, if you can switch it optically, you're able to get down to about uh, you know, almost 10,000 or 100,000, well, this is 10,000 times less than this. Um, and that's the big advantage in terms of power. So now you can imagine uh, having this one switch, um, you know, control the data from a bunch of processors, a bunch of cores in a data center or in a supercomputer and switch it much more efficiently. So I don't know, Luke, if Lewis is here. Where's Lewis? So Lewis is designing electronic chips to basically drive this photonic chip. And so we're very excited about getting this all together. So we need fairly complex electronic chips to do the driving, to do the monitoring of the power levels, to adjust the switches, and also to do the logic, to, to, to take data in and say, OK, I need to configure all these switches in, in some way. So that's, that's what, what Lewis is doing. I'll just end up with a couple other devices that we work on. Um, we're making filters. This is, again, actually Wei Wen Chen's work. Um, and it doesn't really matter. There's, there's a bunch of stuff inside of here. You can see it here. Uh, light comes in. It gets split. It gets delayed and recombined. And there's, there's ring and, and mock center modulators. And, and you get complicated waveforms that only Wei understands. But, um, but there's reasonable agreement between experiment and simulation. So, it kind of did what she was looking for. Um, this is the work that Geza is doing for his thesis. So this is a collaboration with Cisco. This is the laser project that Dan Blumenthal runs. And again, if you do an all optical router, uh, what, what do you need to do? You have two packets that come in. They both want to go to the same output. One of those packets has to be delayed. And so that's what this buffer chip does. And that's what Geza is building. And so you have to both, this, this is the experiment that John Mack did originally. There's only one transmitter. Ideally, you've got multiple transmitters going into a router. And then one of these has to get buffered if it all goes out the same receiver. And so that's what's shown here. Um, if you have multiple ports coming in uh, and they both want to go out the same one, then you need to delay this by some number of recirculations, some number of packet lengths. And so this is the chip that uh, 
John Peters back there and, and Geza built. Um, and these are delay lines. So the data comes in, you switch it up to a delay line, comes back down, switch it up, comes back down. And so you can delay different time lengths and still, still get output. And again, this is John Max measurements, but it just shows that um, you know, back to back with no delay, this thing works pretty well. And with fiber circulations, it still works pretty well as long as the power is up above some given level, in this case, a microwatt of power. Um, so there is a penalty here, and that's what Gaze is focused on. So he's got devices in here which do regeneration or which do filtering. And in fact, that's what this, these devices are designed to be filters. And I don't know if Mokhtai and Hecht is here, but he's done stuff like this in indium phosphide before, and that's what, that's what that is for. So hopefully then these things don't diverge, but, but rather you, that you can delay long, many, many packet lengths. This is work that Andy Chang did for his thesis. Um, and so again, triplexers are what at some point we'll all have in the side of our house, right? Santa Barbara is very backward. Um, Verizon and Cox really don't care about us. But um, at some point, we will get fiber to our home. We'll get you know, Fios coming to our house. And at that point, then you need a box in the side of your house, which does the different functions. You need a, a laser to transmit the data back to the head end, downtown Santa Barbara. When, when the data comes towards your house, at your house, you need to basically split it and divide off the, the digital data, the internet data from the TV data. So you need to combine, have devices that switch two wavelengths together, multiplexers, and then you need to efficiently discriminate between these longer wavelengths, 1490, 1550, and 1310. And so all this has to be put together. Today, in fact, probably by the time we get devices, these are all separate TO headers, right, cans. And they all get put together, and someone in China assembles these together, and, and they give a little box, which is what ends up getting put in our house. What his thesis was, was looking to see whether we can use this, do this on silicon, and integrate all these devices together. And again, make fairly good lasers at one wavelength, and detectors at another wavelength, and all these combiners. So that was what his thesis was. OK. I'll end with what you may have heard about. Intel had a big product announcement in July, or not a product announcement, but press release. Um, they gave, talked a lot about 50 gigabit per second links and uh, uses this technology, so it's kind of where, where they are, basically. Um, so again, it's a, it's a 50 gigabit transmit receive transceiver and uh, uses a silicon chip to do the transmission and a silicon chip to do the reception. And uh, this is pictures of what these things look like. The photonic chips are, are flipped over onto the electronic chip. So you can't see the, what's going on here photonically. Um, this is the back of the photonic chip, and the same thing here. The, the receiver is basically flipped on top of the, uh, of the electronics for this. Um, this is the, what the transmitter looks like. So there's colors of light. Um, and uh, so this uses the technology I've been talking about, which we developed here, uh, hybrid silicon laser technology. And then these are the modulators that Intel has developed. And so it's all integrated together in one chip, but this laser drives this modulator and uh, gets combined in a multiplexer. Those four colors of light get combined with almost no loss, ideally. And that goes to a fiber. So that's the transmitter. Um, so you need to get 50 gigabits. So that's kind of where, where Intel is. That's what it looks like. Um, so that's it for, for that. Um, the receiver chip has a silicon germanium detector on it, or four of them. Um, and actually, uh, the laser processing here was done by a local company, Orion, uh, actually in the clean room here. So, OK, last slide. This is where it all sort of comes together. This is a weird slide. And uh, Tim and others, uh, I don't know if Fred Chong is here, can, can correct me and, 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 uh, and give me a hard time here. This is put together by an optics guy. So Dave Miller is at, at uh, Stanford. but. Uh, Tell me if this is right or not. So this is a plot that shows computational throughput. So we went up to 10 petaflops. And again, again, in 10 years, we need to be 100 times this high, right? So this is kind of where you know, we're at, what, two, two petaflops today. We need to get up to uh, you know, 100 times this axis. So somewhere up, fifth floor up there somewhere. Then what's plotted this way is this inverse power. So here's a kilowatt. Here's 10 megawatts. This is plotted inversely because Basically, goodness is up here. Okay, That's why it's inverted. So we want to get up in this corner. 
very low power, very high speed computation. And so these are supposed to be all the known uh, supercomputers, uh, these red dots here, and they all sort of fall on this line, um, which is limited by electrical interconnects. And uh, basically, if you can do optical interconnects at lower powers, so not 10 nanojoules per bit, but rather suppose you got to a picojoule per bit. And if we get down to a milliamp threshold lasers, we can get to a picojoule per bit. Then you fall over to this line. This line is a picojoule per bit. And so what that means is for the same power, you've now, for, sorry, for the same computational ability, you've now reduced the power by a factor of 100. So that's the goal. Or equivalently, if you sit here at a given power consumption, you know, you go vertically up to this line up here, and you're 100 times more powerful for the same thing. So the whole goal is increasing the bisectional bandwidth of the supercomputer, letting all the different elements talk to each other at much higher speeds and at much lower powers, only taking a picojoule per bit rather than down here, which is, I don't know what that is. Uh, this is 0.11. This must be uh, 10. This is probably 100 pico, roughly 100 picojoules per bit. So that's what we want to enable is get basically supercomputer on this line, and maybe here, 150 joules per bit. We need to get lasers that are, are, are 100 microamp thresholds to do that. And that's tough. We need modulators that are you know, more like VPIs of about 0.1 volt to hit this line up here. But it's theoretically possible. And that's, again, another almost factor of 100 beyond that point for power. So to summarize, these are all the kinds of devices I've talked about. Everything you need to make a link. So this is, you can make multiple lasers of different colors, each with modulators, the way winds work. Multiplex them together. You can amplify them, demultiplex them, run them into detectors. And so those are all the sorts of things that we've been working on here. What's missing are things like ultra-low th threshold lasers. You know, two milliamps is about the maximum you really want to use for a supercomputer interconnect. We need to get below a milliamp or below that. We need higher power amplifiers that take less higher gain amplifiers, higher optical power amplification, but they take less current. So Jason, uh, uh, sorry, Paulo is working on how do you design these structures that are hopefully at least 10 times better than we have today. So we've made amplifiers here. We now need to make them with a tenth the power of what these, these required. Uh, Michael Davenport is working on short Moloch pulse Moloch lasers. And the goal here is rather than having every laser be separate, if you have one mold locked laser, if it's very short, repetitive in time, it generates lots of, lots of modes, right? And it's a Fourier transform relationship. So each of those modes is like one of those channels. And that's what, uh, what he's working on for his thesis. Um, Jason Tian is working on how do you make an optical isolator on this material. Uh, we need non-reciprocal elements integrated together with lasers. Um, Dao Shindai and Zi Wang are working on good polarizers and good polarization rotators. So again, as we make more complicated devices, we need more things that I haven't talked about. And then finally, we need to migrate to something beyond six inches. We need to really take this into a 300 millimeter uh, capability. And so uh, Phil Mages and Chong Zhang are working on uh, ELO. So again, if there's some of you folks who are nitride people, um, you know, epitaxial layer overgrowth is very common in nitrides. If you make say, pattern SiO2 layers on the surface, and then you grow out of here, the material grows up laterally, right? And uh, this layer may be full of dislocations, and that makes it a poor optical emitter. But hopefully this material out on the side is actually very pure and very good. And uh, so you can make your lasers over here. So in fact, the way they're trying to do it, if John Peters would make smaller holes than he's been making, um, the idea is to make them look more like this, nano ELO. And then indeed, this grows up, and hopefully all the dislocations get trapped in here, and they don't make it out of this little layer. And then you grow this very pure film that might only have a few defects here and here. So that's the work that we're doing with uh, Phil Mages is doing in particular. Um, so that's the last one. If you can do that, then you can immediately go to 200, 300 millimeter substrates. And that's, that's kind of what we're doing. So that's sort of high speed. Thank you, and I'm glad to take a bunch of questions. <laughs>
So most of what we're doing is probably very back-end processing. So um, you know, it would be after all the metallizations are done and, and you open up a window in there and put it. It could be grown on some higher level of, of, S, of silicon, polysilicon perhaps. Because again, this opening might only be 100 nanometers. So um, hopefully you've got higher level polycrystalline layers. But it's probably a back-end process. Everything we're doing now is a back-end process. So Intel runs stuff through their fab. Um, and we're, we're not at the front end, the high temperature end. We're at the back end. So that's why the bonding is only at 300 degrees C. Um, but also there's less strain if you do it that way. That, that's a good thing to put on here. So um, uh, the structure that Intel is making is really painful because, because of temperature. So the problem is as they, they, don't want to put thermal, they don't want to put a thermoelectric cooler on this device because it takes so much current and so much power to drive it. So they have to be able to combine those. So I'll take this one. This multiplexer has a given temperature characteristic. These lasers have a different temperature characteristic as these modulators do. So the way they get around the fact that these characteristics change with temperature is they put them very wide apart, 20 nanometers apart. That's really hard for the optics guys to do. If you had athermal designs, you could put these a nanometer apart and it would be so much easier than what they're doing now. So we need to make lasers that are, that are athermal, modulators that are athermal, and multiplexers that are athermal. So for instance, if you take a silicon waveguide and put polymer, the right polymer on it, it has the opposite temperature coefficient as the silicon does. So the right combination of the two make it independent of temperature. So that's absolutely a really important direction to go. Um, but they're doing sort of what, what could one do today? Yeah. So what about the ring filters? What the pressure the pressure Yeah, again. Take a, take a ring filter, put the right polymer on it such that it's temperature independent. So the, the, you know, the positive coefficient of one matches the negative coefficient of the other with the right confinement factor, and it becomes independent of temperature. And that would be uh, um, Okay, now, I mean, polymers, now you're really limiting the, the temperature range you can go to, right? You can't even go to, you may not be able to go to 300 degrees C, at least not for any extended period. But yeah, that, that would be the idea. Um, so in fact, there is a new, just like there's MOSES for electronics, there is a new foundry that's coming up for photonics, and it will include polymer capability. So uh, Moktyan is looking at putting lasers into that shared facility. So for all the photonics people here, that, that is something that's coming over the next year or two, and it's about time. It should have happened a long time ago. So there, this, I think, so Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you and I were grad students, there was lots of versions of, of MOS, right? There was NMOS, there was PMOS, CMOS is being developed, there was VMOS. What are all the different things that used to exist? There were like 20, it was a very rich, you pick up applied physics letters and all these different MOS structures existed. But you're right, it has now gotten very refined down. It's just a transistor, it's just CMOS. They're all the same and you don't choose what variety. So will we choose what kind of laser? No, at, at some point that foundry will have just one version of laser. You don't need to know anything about it. It just has this threshold, this power. And, uh, and so we haven't had that. The same thing with modulators. I showed five different kinds of modulators. There'll be just one. Um, maybe it's ring, maybe it's not. I mean, that hasn't been figured out yet necessarily. Um, Hewlett Packard would say there's just one. It's, it's a ring modulator. That will be the future. 
Ah. Uh, right. The modulators. Yeah. So, you know, this winnowing process will happen, and I think actually it will start happening very quickly over the next five years. That the BAE foundry process will end up with just one laser, just one modulator, um, and you'll have to fit your designs into that. But you can make a much complicated, much more robust circuit as a result. So, yeah, Tim. So it's just a matter of where you're looking, right? So the, the IBM one petaflop computer has, you know, they've got those trays of, of what are the chips, I forget, um, power, power seven chips is what they are. Um, and the fibers come right up to those, right? And so the vixels they're using are right up against the edges of that chip. Um, and uh, so certainly right now at a one petaflop level, the fibers are going up to the edge of these these mammoth multi-core processing chips. They're not on the chip, but, but the communication between the cores inside that chip is still is still electronic. It's still oh today is is electrical. That's right. But I'm saying that replacing some of the electrical solutions, selecting the by some optical solutions, instead of looking at a mesh topology of the network, I'm saying they have some kind of uh, high-speed highway which is on optical. I, I'm hopeful that once photonics gets into a CMOS foundry with the CMOS process control capability, that you can the, the level of integration will, will explode compared to where we are today. Um, so we'll see whether that's true or not. Um, but but this is a big thing, right? So this is this is kind of fundamental. When you switch things electrically, like you know router chips or things like that, you know your your processor is looking at every bit, and if you switch it electrically on chip or off chip. Every bit you're looking at, right? It's, 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 it's processing every bit and taking electricity to do every bit. When we switch stuff, this, this modulator is capacitive. It takes, the only time it takes any power is when you, trans, when you switch from on to off. It's a transitory thing just like CMOS. And so I don't think, you know, this may be aggressive in terms of getting 100,000, but it's easy to get 100 times lower power because all you're doing is switching a capacitor and you've got 40 or 100 gigabit data going through there. So I'm pretty convinced this will happen. And then I think we can combine this intimately with electronics. So it may not be what, like you said, the first, the next round is probably not to have, have it bonded on top, but rather I mean, using the stuff that Luke has demonstrated, where you take an electronic chip and a photonic chip and you put them adjacent, and then you spit on glass and you process it and make all the interconnects. So you're not having separate packages and wires and things like that, but it becomes one combined monolithic chip. So I mean, that's what I hope, hope we do with, with Louise and, and uh, Luke. Um, so I think that is an intermediate step before you actually put it on top. But I think also the, the photonic chip is not made in the same foundry as the electronic chip, right? So the electronic chip will be, 
32 nanometer, you know, very, very expensive, very high performance silicon. Our devices are big. They're, you know, they'll be made in some 90 nanometer process, which is much less, literally 100 times less expensive. And so when we, when we flip them, you know, this, this costs a penny compared to a dollar per square centimeter. And, and those are pretty real numbers. Um, That's correct. So indeed, a typical chip, I think, is about 50 watts. I think those are your numbers. 50 watts are electrical power for the I.O. And uh, not so much within chip, but I think just to do the I.O. Within chip. within chip, yes, that's another significant fraction. So, but again, where we have to be optically is we have to be at a picojoule per bit to, to compete. So we need to be at milliamp thresholds mil and volt, one volt drive powers, not something much higher. So. I mean, I think Intel's modulator is literally at least a factor of 100 away from where it needs to be. So they've demonstrated it. It's a very nice demonstration. But it's at least 100 times more power per bit than, than we need. So that's where we need to go next. So. I just thank John. Thank you. Yeah. How small do you have to make those holes?